So it gives me great pleasure to invite you again to another series of lectures in dermatology, our way of giving back to the community that we love and that loves us most of the time back. <laughs> uh, today we'll be talking about how to understand your skin. And one of the most common problems is dry skin and eczema. And if you ask the question, what's the largest organ in the body? It is actually the skin. And just like our skin covers our body, it's the same thing like the house encasing where we live. And if we don't take care of the roof, we'll have leaking in our house. If we don't care of the wall, take care of closing the door or of the walls, then people will come in that not necessarily want to come in. We won't feel secure. The same thing, the same security is vitally important for the health of our body. And it's not that we can buy another body, like we can buy another house. So. Here, without further ado, I bring you Dr. Sheep, who is going to tell us about it, and Ali also, she's a PA student, she'll tell us about it, and then I'll share some cases and uh, summarize it all for you. So, thank Dr. You, Sheep, thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone in cyberspace. Thank you for all who came out today, um, bearing the weather, um, so I really appreciate you coming. So, we're going to talk a little bit about eczema, which is one of the most common dermatological conditions that you'll see in medicine. Oftentimes, people present with these itchy areas, primarily on the um, folds of the skin and the backs of this area as well. We call eczema the itch that rashes because essentially what happens is that you scratch your skin so much that you develop a rash. So if you hear anyone say the itch that rashes, it's generally referring to eczema. So here are some common photos that we see with patients who have eczema. Like I said, they get the rash right here in these areas. They can get it on the cheeks and the little kiddos. And then we also have these telltale signs from dermatologists like to refer to as the name Morgan lines across the eyes because he rubbed their eyes so much and they're irritated. Or we call this an allergic salute when you get this dark band across the nose. So that happens when people rub their nose because eczema is generally in this triad of conditions. We say allergies. We also ask if there's any history of eczema, if there's any history of asthma. So we call it the triad of the allergic allergies. So atopic dermatitis, like I said, is one of the most common skin conditions, primarily seen in young kiddos. By the age of six months, about 45%, give or take, are diagnosed by that time frame. Majority of times we say that you can grow out of eczema, but sometimes there's a small set of people who continue throughout their lives. Now, eczema's primary problem is that we have a problem in the barrier, as Dr. Levitt suggested, and is correct about that. So those barriers, we have our top layer of our skin called our epidermis, and we have a bottom layer of our skin called our dermis. We wanna make sure that that epidermis stays really intact. If you have any nicks or cracks in there, then it's more likely that you'll lose water in the skin. So primarily with people who have eczema during the winter time is when they have their most um, problematic years. That's because there's less humidity or moisture in the atmosphere so their skin is a little bit more prone to being dry as well as them taking hot showers and so forth during that time as well. So here is the pathway of eczema. There are multiple things that can lead to eczema worsening and the cause of eczema. One is genetics so we'll talk about that a little bit. Another thing is in their environment and then some other things that we talk about is taking hot showers and not moisturizing your skin. We always start to talk about people who are using fragrances and their soaps, the Bed Bath & Beyond and the Body Works, they smell so good, but a lot of them have chemicals within them that can dry the skin. Anything that has propylene alcohol within it can dry the skin out. So we try to tell you to use more moisturizers and so forth with eczema. But here's the pathway that we generally refer to. It's primarily a problem with this filaggrin mutation Majority of people have a null loss, which means that gene is not functioning properly, and that gene is associated with filaggrin, so you'll have problems with that barrier in the skin layer. So our main goal is to make sure that we keep that barrier intact. So if we're able to repair that by different mechanisms and different medications, which Dr. Levitt, as well as Ali, would be discussing a little later, you'll see that whole pathway. But primarily, we need to make sure that we can decrease this immune response and kind of better the whole topics of the skin. Like I said, it's a loss in the function of the mutation of prophylaxis gene, and this mutation is covers about ten to twenty to thirty percent of patients with um, um, out of atopic dermatitis. Sorry. So I'll step in. I'll leave you with Valley. Hi everyone. Um, 
Um, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm just going to speak a little bit about um, diet and its relation to eczema. Thank you. So, um, as Dr. Ship said, eczema is uh, also called atopic dermatitis, and it can be seen as this itchy um, rash that's seen in flexural surfaces, so the elbows, behind the knees, um, faces on infants. And um, although it does seem more common, it actually only exists in 10 to 20 percent of children and 1 to 3 percent of adults, depending on the source that you use. Um, and it does tend to decrease in prevalence as children get older, so um, usually presents within the first few years of life in 60 percent of children with it. Um, and then 30% uh, of patients by age five, and then 10% between the ages of six and 20. So obviously it's in, um, incidence starts to decrease as children get older. Um, and you can be more likely to have eczema if one or both parents have eczema. Um, so things that can make it worse, as Dr. Ship said before, was um, winter, dry skin, um, certain uh, clothing materials such as wool, um, and any uh, allergens in the air, like dust mites, pollen, um, emotional stress, and um, bacteria can just make it worse. So those um, Staph aureus and Group A strep are just two different types of bacteria. Um, so uh, although you may think that diet may play a significant role, it actually doesn't play as much of a role in as much as you would think. So um, it can exacerbate skin lesions in children who are young with severe or moderate um, eczema, but um, it's not as common in older children and adults. And as many as 40% of children have um, food allergies that already have that moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So it's, it can be, um, you know, there is an association. And um, foods just um, trigger this um, responsive, hyper responsive reaction within the host. It's called um, IgE, it's um, different aminos products that are released and um, it can occur with um, the consumption of um, foods that are typically seen as allergens such as milk, pro um, eggs, peanuts, soybeans. And um, really the only time that food allergy testing is indicated is when um, someone is under five and they have really severe uh, eczema or that um, has onset severely or it's not managed well with um, typical treatments like steroids and moisturization. And um, even though um, it can be associated with food, it, studies have shown that removing these allergen foods um, don't really reduce the incidence of uh, flare-ups unless there is a diagnosed food allergy by either like um, a blood test which measures that IgE immune uh, compound or um, a skin spot test that will show a hypersensitive reaction. Uh, and then actually these elimination diets that avoid total food groups are actually shown to have the negative effects of nutritional deficiencies and um, reduced birth weight and softening of the skeleton, so osteomalacia and fractures. So uh, it's actually recommended to um, introduce these foods that are seen as allergens early on during infancy, so that way um, they can avoid having um, allergic reactions when it is taken away for a while and then reintroduced. Um, and then, like I said before, if um, the eczema cannot be managed well with topical steroids, avoiding these triggers and frequent moisturization, then um, allergy testing would be indicated. And um, all, all this topic with GMOs and different ways um, foods are produced, it's, it's kind of very hard to determine if it's better or worse for the condition because there's a lot of variations in it depending on the crop, the allergens present within the uh, individual themselves, so it's just very hard to detect. So further research needs to be done about that. And um, anti-inflammatory diets can be helpful in just any person who is experiencing this condition reduce the amount of flare-ups that they have. So you can have fish, um, the omega-3s are great for reducing inflammation and um, probiotics important in restoring that um, gut flora and just overall well-being as well as foods high in flavonoids which fight inflammation. So that can be a whole variety of fruits and vegetables. Okay, so Dr. Sheep and Ali did an amazing job, and uh, Dr. Sheep uh, told you about the pathophysiology, the process of how 
ectopic dermatitis and eczema happens. And Ali also educated me about some of the foods, what to eat, what not to eat, what age to introduce the food for their children. And that's amazing information. Thank you so much. And uh, now I get to have the fun of after you're scared about what happens when your gut doesn't function properly and your microbiome is not good on the surface or on the inside. You can change your genes, you know, the parents that you have are the parents that you have. And what we can change is the things that we'll talk about in therapy. So most important thing I find when I speak to the patients is getting the history. And the reason the history is so important is because you are better able to, through pathophysiology, which is what Dr. Sheep has just told us, discern what factors in the person's lifestyle, in his interaction, in his occupation perhaps, in his home, maybe he's got a pet, maybe he works in an area with a lot of dust, so there's a dust mite perhaps allergy, maybe he's someone who's uh, in an area that is very humid or he wears wool, all those things are very important and I'll show you soon cases to make it more relevant on people who just actually came today and I, I were kind enough to allow me to take the pictures to show you guys. So let's uh, look, after we did our Sherlock Holmes work, and I'll show you how one can do that, it's the other door. You uh, look at proper skincare, and I liken it to the tiles that are on the floor. So if you imagine to yourself, like Dr. Sheep was saying, the epidermis, the uppermost layer of the skin, it's kind of like tiles when you look under the microscope. The problem is, if there is no seal around those tiles, then just like Dr. Sheep was saying, you'll have water leaving the body and then you'll be like a raisin in the sun, the cells will be shrinking. Now if they will be shrinking, they will be separating and the gap will only enlarge. And through that gap, not only things can exit like water exits and so we're becoming dehydrated and you can drink as much as you want, it won't replenish that water, but also bacteria and other pathogens can enter through that area and when the pathogens enter the body sees those bacteria and it says hey we have to seal those walls there is a war going on so the body starts to fight it and it tells us scratch that area so you can remove the bacteria but when we scratch that area we have also bacteria on our nails and it continues to only cry and cry more kind of like a baby when they cry and you don't know do they have colicky pain do they need food do they not sleep the same thing the skin starts itching and we are like what are we to do so what are we to do when that happens after we figured out what caused it what we can avoid in our daily activities we should look at things besides the clothing that we wear. I had patients who couldn't wear anything except cotton. If he wore anything else, his eczema as an adult was insane. He actually had to be on oral and IV medications for that. Home environment. So you can get a humidifier. Like Dr. Chip was saying, when it's winter time, the body is trying to equilibrate just like anything else with the atmosphere. And if it's very, very dry because you're having centralized heating, then it will suck all the air, all the water out of the skin. And if you don't have a good sealer, a good barrier around those tiles, around the epidermis, then the moisture will come out and then it will only exacerbate the cracks in the skin protection. So you want to have a humidifier in the house, but you don't want to be too hot. So if it's too hot in the, in the uh, house, it also causes you to itch. It opens the vessels, the vessels release those mediators that cause the itch to form and we'll talk a little bit about them. Other things that you can do is diet a little bit. Some people talk about probiotic and it's becoming much more in vogue. People understand that there are a couple of ways that outside irritants can enter our system. They can enter through the skin, they can enter through the airway. That's why we're talking about the atopic triad, as Dr. Sheep was mentioning, the hay fever, the asthma, and the eczema. And if we have the eczema, when the skin sees the allergen, whether it is uh, a rubber allergen, so we are hand washing a lot as physicians, a lot of us have allergy to latex. If we have cracks and the body sees the bacteria and the allergen from the rubber, for example, if we take gloves as an example, 
it starts developing an allergy to those gloves and then we cannot wear them again. So it, it is very, very important to have the, the eczema treated and cured as early as possible because through those cracks, allergens can enter and we will become allergic to those allergens. Uh, bleach baths. So bleach baths were actually used during civil war to disinfect the wounds. And for a while it came back uh, uh, in the 80s and then it fell out of vogue and it's back again in vogue. Now the idea about bleach baths is we have a lot of bacteria in our skin and if we have eczema, those bacteria that colonize our skin will be exposed to the body's immune system and the body's immune system will start fighting it and it will get so excited that it will start fighting it all over the body even if there is no bacteria there. It's kind of I tell people if you've had a bad day at work and you come home and your spouse did something that they always did. Maybe they put the shoes out of order. They didn't remove their shoes right away when they came to the house. You start screaming at them and they tell you, what we did it always that way. You never screamed before. It's the same thing. The body is already revved up and it will overreact to the minutest of irritants. So when you do the bleach baths, you disinfect the skin so the body can learn to calm down a little bit. The other thing that you can do, and people are afraid of it, but you should not be afraid of it because it's more important to use the topical steroid and heal those cracks than to let those cracks remain open, allergens get in, bacteria gets in, infection gets in, and your immune system is out of whack. There are different types of topical steroids and the dermatologist should advise you which one you should use. You should not use a high potency, very strong steroid for a long time on area that is not an area that has a problem, otherwise you will have atrophy. There are some conditions that are different, like vitiligo or psoriasis that are resistant to the atrophy if there is a problem, but besides those few conditions, you should be very cautious with the topical steroids. The other thing is light therapy. If you remember in the Bible, there the, was a case where the general of one of the countries bordering Israel came over to be treated by one of the prophets who told him to go to wash in the Jordan River and he was like laughing at him, wanted to start war and he told him no, go there. And he went over there and this place where the Jordan River uh, connects to the Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. And because it's the lowest place on earth, the light that reaches there is specifically almost working as a laser to help psoriasis, eczema and probably that general had psoriasis as opposed to leprosy and his psoriasis when he went over there cleared. Other things that uh, came up later on are things like Eladil and Protopic. There was for a time a concern about risk with cancer, uh, lymphoma specifically, but that risk has not been realized and even though there is a black box warning, a study in 2016 in the British Journal of Dermatology for Pediatrics showed that it does not actually cause um, any cancers in uh, children. But in the study, they injected a much higher concentration and they did it IV and it was in mice, not in humans. But still, the recommendation is don't use it more than six weeks. The other thing that they came up with, which is really amazing, is uh, Eucrisa. Eladil and Eucrisa and Protopic, all those things work very well. The problem is if you apply it on wounds, again, this, the skin is already inflamed, is already irritated, doesn't want those things, except if you shrink a little bit the blood vessels, which is what the steroids does. It causes vasoconstriction, and that's why you can apply the steroid and you don't, for the most part, get burning, except depending on the vehicle. So you need to apply those creams, Eldil or Eucrisa, when the skin is already healed, preferably, or is intact. Otherwise, other things that you can do is things that suppress the immune system. The fastest working is cyclosporin, and we will see results really like in a week, in two weeks, but you have to be careful about the kidneys, other medications available, and the most exciting one is uh, Dupixin, which is an injection IV that uh, helps the, regulate the immune system that is responsible for the eczema. This is too much detail that I probably gave you, I get a little carried away, but let me uh, show you an example. So this lovely lady came today, a couple of days of a rash on her chest. Now when you say eczema, it's a basket that includes a variety of things. It comes from the Greek word 
uh, ek, which uh, later on in Latin got uh, changed to ex, meaning exit, so it's out, and uh, zima means to boil over. So it connects a topic dramatitis, like um, we were saying, like Ali was saying, and Dr. Sheep was saying, and also other type of weeping red uh, scaly rashes. So this was on her chest, and if you look at it, uh, you first right away has to ask what did she use, and she must have used something on that area that would cause it. And she was using a um, uh, vitamin cream for the acne, and you can see there's acne there, and it burnt her skin, so it would concentrate a little bit more over there. So retin A, which we use for wrinkles, if you overuse it, or the skin is very sensitive in that area will cause a burn reaction like that. So this is not, uh, this is called an eczema, but this is not a topic dermatitis. What about this lady? She was coming in with this rash around the eyes. It almost looks like she literally put something on the eyes. No, it's not. I thought I had another picture of it. So what happened is, I thought we were going to show you the picture there, is she had glasses that she was supposed to wear all the time. And she came for the light box one time and she was thinking about something else. She took the glasses and she held them in her hand instead of putting them on. But because each time we increase the dose of the light therapy, we talked about the Dead Sea. It's basically based on the Dead Sea, that light therapy called Narabhan UDB, which is used for eczema. She developed a sunburn over there on her eyes. And so we're gonna give her a topical steroid to take away that kind of sunburn, that eczematous reaction. Well, this I see very often. Um, the child was treated with a topical steroid for about three, four months. He has a rash on his hands, very, very itchy. Well, his father came the day before and he was also mistreated. And he has also an itchy rash. I asked him to make sure whether his kid is itching. He said, oh yes, my kid is itching too. And what about your wife? No, she's not itching. Well, his wife came and she's actually itching too. So this is scabies. And sometimes it's very hard to diagnose. It looks simple right now. You look for the boros. The picture doesn't show it so well. And there are sometimes like just little papules. But in the meantime, the kindergarten, the job where he works, the bus that he sits in, you know, everybody will sit in that place and will be now infected with the, with the scabies. So it's very important that if you have an itch, that you see a professional and they evaluate it. And if it's not someone who is trained in dermatology, they should refer them to a dermatologist because we don't want to miss eczema. And I've seen people actually get the immunosuppressants for what they thought was eczema or psoriasis because there is this condition as we know that looks almost like psoriasis but we call it Norwegian scabies it means very contagious scabies I and mean, you just walk into the room and you feel like you're getting it already and those people died from the immunosuppressive side effects because they couldn't get better the each and it was in fact this condition scabies excuse me what is immunosuppressive for? so we have a, a, Sometimes our immune system is too active and we need to tell it to calm down. It's kind of like you see someone screaming in the street, ah, it's like psychotic. It's like, you know, calm down, what is the problem? So you calm the skin down because if you don't, it overacts and it throws you out of whack. You cannot do other things. You cannot put your uh, body in order because it's so scratchy, so itchy, you cannot leave. So you calm the skin down a little bit. So this gentleman has been going, and that is a very interesting case. He's been to a couple of dermatologists who are very good. Uh, he's um, head of uh, a big corporation. He has uh, multiple hobbies that he does. If you look on, on, on both hands, he, I asked him, are you right-handed? And that's where I say history is very important. Are you right-handed or left-handed? He's like, I'm right-handed, okay? And his right hand has nothing. This is only on his left hand only on his left hand and he's got those thick lesions. So we, we always think of worst case scenario. So worst case scenario would be whether he has dermatomyositis, for example, that's a connective tissue disorder. That's like an autoimmune disorder. So does he have a rash around the eyes? Does he have muscle weakness? Is it hard for him to comb his hair? No, he doesn't have any issues like that. So you ask for more information. 
No, he's really right-handed. Yes, he has a yacht, uh, he does scuba diving, but he does pull those um, the, 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 the sail of, of the boat with both hands, but really he's, he's right hand and the left doesn't really do much. So any clue about what you think may have caused it? So there is a very not enough recognized condition, um, which we call brachioradial pruritus. Now, brachioradial pruritus is a condition where you have the itch that scratches, kind of like Dr. Sheep was saying. It itches, you start scratching it, and you develop the rash. And clearly, you can see this is thickened skin, so he's been scratching. Now, why is he scratching just that? And well, he's right-handed, obviously easier to scratch the left than do the left the right, but why? And it's new. And he's not nervous, he's sitting in a room, he's calm. So, we used to think it's related to the sun. You're driving your hand outside, and that's what caused it. And then we realize that it's actually related to nerve damage. So you know those people that had amputations, they actually feel that they want to scratch their toes, their toes don't exist there anymore, but they have that memory that they want to scratch. He had, uh, he, he likes extreme sports, so he was doing extreme uh, skiing, and he had a fracture on his left hand, a really severe fracture that happened about a year before that happened. I just saw him today. And after that, about a year, this stuff started appearing and more and more of those lesions. So he's not doing boxing or he's not, you know, doing, so this is basically happened from nerve damage. And we've seen a lot of those kind of things. We've seen to the degree where I had a woman, she came in, I think I showed the picture when we were giving a talk about hair loss. She had a complete hair loss and that was from, uh, compression that she had of one of her nerves there and it was so itching that she rubbed her hair off. So this lovely lady was treated with steroids. This is hard to tell here, but this is a close-up picture of her nipple. So, you know, uh, obviously we have Dr. Sheep and he knows what it is, but and I know Yelena also knows what it is, uh, but, but what would you think is the cause of this nipple eczema, which is one of the minor criteria, kind of like what Dr. Sheep said, Danny Morgan lines, the, those lines that are under the eyes that he showed you from the friction from the eczema. Nipple eczema is common with the topic dermatitis. So what do you think is causing it? Bra. Maybe bra, bra, maybe rubbing, so it's only on one side, that's very good, maybe the bra. Her, her areola is not showing here, but it's not really affected, the, the skin around the nipple. What else? Maybe perfumes, maybe some contacts, to maybe the baby sucking baby on the area. Sucking. Yeah, that's no, right. no, the baby is not sucking on the area. Does she have eczema? Yes, she has a little bit of eczema on her hands. Um, as a child, she had some hay fever, some uh, rashes were more on the face, you know, as a, as a topic of dermatitis, but she outgrew it. You know, like most people, about 80% outgrow it by the age of 10. Anything else? So the, the reason I'm showing it is an example of why it is important that you see a dermatologist. So one of the things that we worry about with this kind of rash is is cancer. And this is actually breast cancer. It's mm -hmm. called Paget's disease of the breast. So, <laughs> in summary, I want to tell you that eczema is a big basket case of things that include everything that trashes. And to tell the difference between something that you can just put steroid and resolve and something that should be biopsied or needs maybe a different medication requires a knowledgeable, experienced dermatologist. And the American Academy of Dermatology has a list of board certified dermatologists. So you want to make sure that when you check whether the person is a dermatologist, you actually look at online and see that there, he's not a person who just wants to do cosmetic and calls himself as a dermatologist, but actually is a board certified dermatologist. Anybody with any questions? Do we have any questions on the... Do you have anything about tinea? Tinea, yeah, I would like to hear some. Yes, yes, like tinea, like fungus, no? Yeah, that's actually a good question. That's in the differential anytime you think about tinea. I'm sorry. Oh. 
So that's always a differential when you're thinking about eczema, tinea's in there. Tinea, yeah, yeah that's just like basically a fungal, fungal infection. Mm -hmm. So any of those fungal infections you need to make sure, and like Dr. Levitt said, you should also, also see a dermatologist who's well informed and can differentiate between the two. Um, because tinea actually is itchy as well. You get some flakes with tinea, so that's good to have in the differential. A good way to differentiate the two is you can actually do a little scraping. We can look under a microscope, we call it oh. potassium hydroxide or KOH. And we can look under the microscope and tell if something is a fungus infection versus something different. Okay. And that's helpful even with scabies too. Like when Dr. Levitt showed you those pictures of scabies, you do a little scraping, look under the microscope, you'll see a little mite there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Uh, I was just thinking, you know, if you can have a lecture about fungus, maybe that's a topic, as a topic? I think we have already the list of the lectures set till the end of the of the year, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We I have, I think, so. is it acne we're talking about? Uh, hey, I'm not 100%. Uh, <laughs> possibly. Lila, do you remember? Also not? Okay. But uh, you can uh, look, uh, give us a call here to the office and they'll tell you about the list of the lectures. We usually do it on Thursday. Next Thursday, Dr. Sheep and I will be talking about some uh, cosmetic fillers right before the holidays mm -hmm. and there will be a special on the price of the filler so it will be about 25% uh, off the usual price and all you have to do is buy it on that day, you don't have to do the procedure on that day and then you can schedule it with Dr. Sheep and me and we can uh, do that uh, for you. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank Hopefully you, you. everything showed on the virtual. If not, you'll have to go on our uh, website, right? Sergey, where is it? Where is it? Uh, on Levitt Dermatology. And you can go on the videos and you can see Dr. Sheep and I giving lectures and Ali today also. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.